You're listening to Parasearch Radio. News, views and reviews from the world of the paranormal from across the UK and beyond. Find us on Facebook, Twitter and the World Wide Web. The views and opinions expressed by presenters and guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Parasearch Radio or their affiliates and sponsors. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to Haunted Histories with your host, Penny G. Morgan, right here on Parasearch UK Radio. Good evening, everybody. How are we? Hi, Richard. You're in bright and early. Good to see you. Good to see you. I hope you're well. And that looked an amazing walk that you did earlier today. It looked very beautiful. A very beautiful scenery. How are we all doing? I hope everyone's keeping well and doing well and all that kind of thing. We've got some very exciting stuff going on at Parasearch at the moment. We've got two new shows starting for you in August. Not one, but two. Our lovely Jolene is going to be back with a, a new a new show, and I believe her first guest is the uh, rather well-known Sally Morgan. And then we've also got Neil and Jane, who used to do the uh, Parology, Parology Hour from the Haunted um, Antiques Research Centre. I hope I said that right. They're going to be doing a show with us as well. How brilliant is that? How brilliant is that? We've got so many good shows coming up for you. So make sure you know where to go. Every Monday to Friday, I think even some shows are going to be on. We're going to have two shows a night on coming up. How cool is that? Well, I'm excited. I may not sound it right now, but I am. I'm excited about all of that. Well, what else have we got going on? Or what have I got going on? Well, <coughs> excuse me. It was actually my birthday last week, which I know I had many, many very lovely birthday messages. So thank you all. Thank you all for those. Um, but my uh, lovely husband surprised me on the Saturday and we went into London for the day, which isn't that major, considering that I'm only sort of a 40 minute train ride away. But he uh, decided to surprise me and made it a perfect day for me. In the morning, we went to the Imperial War Museum and spent a good few hours few hours there and then after that we went off to explore HMS Belfast something that I have never done before and I tell you what if you're ever in London and you want to have a look at stuff apart from the fact that the Imperial War Museum it's free yes it's huge and it's free so don't ever pass that one up if you get the chance but also the um HMS Belfast, it's it's absolutely fascinating and it's it's got a very strange vibe to it in certain parts. What was funny is that husband always teases me about the fact that I would have been an officer if I was in the forces. He's probably right, I probably would have been. But he always teases me about that. Well, the thing was, I definitely felt more comfortable on the upper decks and uh, didn't feel so comfortable on the lower decks. I guess what? That's where he felt more comfortable. And he always jokes he would have been a grunt and I would have been one of the uh, people shouting at him. But it's definitely worth doing. Definitely worth doing. Oh, I'd love to have spend spend the night on the Belfast and find out what was going on on there because there's definitely something there. Definitely something there. Hi, Emma. Thank you for joining us. Right. Well, without much further ado, because I've got a, a cracking interview lined up for you. Well, let's play it, shall we? Well, have I got a treat for you tonight, people. Live and in person. Well, not live. This is a pre-record due to work commitments. But you know what I mean. You know what I mean. But all the way from, I don't know. Is Has it been sunny in Doncaster today, Rosie and Stuart Dawson? On and off, on and off. It's been very, bit. very stormy as well. Yeah. So, well, I'll say, live from sunny Doncaster, we've got the the bosses of Simply Ghost Nights the gorgeous Dawson's. How are you doing, guys? That's Very fun. well, thank, thank you, Penny. Penny. Good, good. Gorgeous, gorgeous Penny. Oh, thank you. Thank Equally you. Back good. at you. Back at you. <laughs> how are you? How are you, anyway? What have you been up to? What's new? What's cooking? Um, 
well, we've got a new one coming up in Durham. That's an old manor house. Used to be an orphanage. Um, that's on August the 10th. We're very excited about that one. That's a sleepover event. Um, but apart from that, nothing new. But well, equally as up. exciting, though, our usuals. We've got Ripon coming up. We've got the old Steelworks Hospital in concert coming up. We've got mm-hmm. so much. Gresinol, your favourite, Penny. Oh, you're doing Gresinol? When are you doing that again? In September. Oh. What date? Um, the 20 something. 20th and 21st. Ah. I don't know. I don't. I think I'm. If I'd known, I would have come to say hello. I would have used it as an excuse to get spoilt by my parents, but. I think I'm actually working that... Oh, no, I'm actually in Ipswich during the day, so I'm not a million... You never know. I may right. turn up. Right, OK. I may turn up to say hello. Yeah, that's it... fine. Just give us a bell on the day. Let's face it, September will be slightly warmer than the January we did it in. Yeah. Mm. That was very cold that night. No, I think it was February. Was it February? Was it February? I know it was yeah, beginning of the year, and it was, it was yeah, like February. minus figures before we even started, yeah. if I remember rightly. But yes. oh, I love that place. I do love that place. But this orphanage one, it you say yeah. in Durham, that sounds an interesting. It is. Um, I mean, I don't like to usually mention the fact that it's it was originally on the very very original season of um, Most Haunted, the very first season that they did. Right. And it was a creepy old place then when they did it, and that was you know in the early days. Um. And believe it or not, it's located probably three miles from where I grew up. So I know the oh, location. Wow. Yeah, so in the olden days, it was an orphanage and it was one of the really, really bad orphanages where right. they really did treat them badly. You know, so it's got some grim history behind it. And apparently there's spirits there that have once upon a time dragged a child out of bed in the middle of the night. Christ. We did hear we went there a few times about eight, nine years ago, didn't we? And we then, did, and then we stopped using it, and then we've decided, you know, let's do that again. We haven't been for a while. You know, when locations get overused, you tend mm. to take a break, and yeah. I think a lot of people take a break. Well, a lot of people took a break from this one, and they thought, like, you know, let's give it another shot, and I'm quite excited, actually, about going back. What's it called? It's called The Old Manor House in Ferry Hill. Ferry Hill. Yeah. Ah, that sounds an interesting one. Well, you know, I'm always looking for new shows for 2020, so. <laughs> yeah, well, there you are then. <laughs> You'll have to put that on the do list. I, I have, I've just written it down. I have just written it down as a, a, as a possible. And we'll excuse the fact it was in season one of Most Haunted, because let's be honest, the early few seasons weren't too bad. They, they actually it. were quite, um, they're the ones that you can bear watching without yeah. sort of just putting your face in your hands and going no 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 yeah. no no in the in the days when it was absolutely believable because they caught an orb Penny, what you know they you, were the best days what could you be insinuating <laughs> that it became a bit too much for entertainment purposes <laughs> we that, get yeah that maybe the research wasn't as thorough as it could have been mm-hmm they should have had you doing the history. They, sh- they should have done, shouldn't they? I keep telling programmes this. I, I, I told Chris from Tennessee Race Chasers this off air last week when I did the show with him and Gina that because I was telling him stuff about somewhere that he's visited quite a few times that he didn't know. And I said, you need to hire me, B. You know, I don't charge much. Yeah. Just, you know, pay for me I'll to get wait. Out. Pardon? There's nobody does the There's nobody does history quite like you, Penny. Oh, thank you, my love. I hope that's a compliment, though. It is. <laughs> It really. I mean, we've done many a location and been there time after time, and then you come up with information on that location, and I'm like, I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> I just it, it's it's one of those weird things. I mean, we joke about Kerry, um, the para, who runs Parasearch. We joke about the fact we we disappear off down rabbit holes with research, and you do. I mean, the the stuff I was doing for the research for RAF Binbrook, and, and my knowledge of their RAF and Air Forces and World War Two stuff is pretty good anyway I probably spend about six or seven hours in total researching it because I'd go off down off on tangents on things to and you just don't realize and you pick up other bits of information that the EM find are useful for subsequent shows and things so it's um and you have to have a passion for it 
I think you have to have a passion for the learning and retaining it or at least knowing you read that somewhere where did you write that note down and what was it on and so yeah it is um it is uh something I do enjoy I enjoy doing and I think one of my favorite things is when I've done an investigation or a, a group I, I've worked with who gives me say oh, look we found this out when we were there can you see if you can find any sort of historical verification that this we could be on track here and that's one of the most exciting things I think the history side I I do is is when somebody gives me some information so say for example if you gave me a name that was coming up from Ripon and I could find them um on the workhouse log that's the sort of thing that I find quite quite exciting to do in fact I think Um, you actually did that once with our Belkery events we gave you a name and you yeah, came I back did. That yeah name. i did yeah well the ch- it wasn't it the chap who was burned you said you could yeah. smell yeah. Burn. Yeah. yeah yeah that that kind of thing i i i do get i i, I enjoy doing it but conversely yeah. i also can do the opposite when when you get sort of people saying there's such and such a thing happened and, and in essex you get it a lot with the witch trials you get people saying oh such and such a witch was burned at the stake and all that and you're like well they didn't burn witches at the stake so that's the first big mistake <laughs> and then you've and there's there's one of the pubs i think not too far from me actually where i am they say some guy he he he's seen there because he used to live in the old schoolhouse and he murdered his wife and son and he was hanged well he would have been hanged at chelmsford no his name isn't on the hanging record this was in the 1800s so he would also why would he have been living at the schoolhouse when the school was still open mm. then there's all these sort of things that I, I don't even have to look up that to question and I know, I know it upsets people sometimes because I kind of ruin their fun but it is something that I I believe passionately because I think the the, the, his, the the fact is actually stranger than fiction sometimes when you start to really dig into it yeah. so yeah, I do enjoy. I do enjoy that, and um, good to get records straight, isn't it? I think so. I think so because then it gives it more validity when you do have experiences, and you can you can prove them, um, and you can you know, like you say, that name that I found for you from Belper, and I'm sure I did something as well to do with R- Ripon once as well. I verified something for you historically, and that to me it just concert. validates yeah. and concept, yeah, and it, it just validates what you guys are finding from a paranormal basis um i've done it quite a few times with paul stevenson as well as some of the places he visits i've given him names and they're like oh my gosh those names are coming through and they have they have it on film that those names are coming through i didn't and i explained who the names were so yeah it's it's uh, i do enjoy that side of it um even if it does upset people sometimes (laughs) but I know we've talked before about Doncaster Air Museum, which I found fascinating, and that's definitely still on my to-do list at some point. Um, But one of the ones we actually... We actually burst my husband's paranormal cherry at this place. We did, Um, R.F. Bimbrook. R.F. Bimbrook in... Is it classed as Lincolnshire or Leicestershire? Is it Lincolnshire? Lincolnshire. It is Lincolnshire. Um, Yeah, R.F. Bimbrook. Now, you guys have been there quite a lot, haven't you? And you've been going there for a long time. Yeah. Yeah, we were the first company in there. We got invited by the previous caretaker. There were some paranormal uh, goings on. We went out and found a really interesting place and then started doing investigations there, didn't we? About, yeah. about seven, eight years ago. Now, what up, what up, what is interesting about Bimbrook, and, and this is quite unusual for a disused... And it, it was an RAF base, it's not a, a former US Air Force base, which a lot of them are that people now can get to go into, a former US Air Force bases. This is a former RAF base, although I'll, I'll go into its sort of timeline in a sec. But what what's unusual about it is an awful lot of the buildings still survive. Mm. Um, you've still got all the original hangars. I think there's five of them, C-class hangars, if I remember rightly. There's five of them. You've still got the original water tower. There's even still one of the original uh, bunkers that they would have used if they were being um, under attack. And and this is very, very unusual for a disused RAF base. But all these things are now used on the industrial estate, which is kind of next to the part that yeah. you guys investigate. 
Um, and I must admit, when when my husband and I were sort of, we got there a bit early because we'd driven up from Essex, and we did have a drive around the industrial estate because the gates were open, and you could spot the MOD buildings. It was very very easy. It was quite obvious they were former MOD. It, it, you, di- you didn't even need an imagination. But the area that you guys get to use is um, what was the f- the sergeant's mess and sergeant's quarters, mm-hmm. wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, and th- and that's one of the first things I'm going to put my sort of pop the balloon on. In that a lot of people describe it as being the officer's mess. That that's kind of completely the opposite. It was the sergeant's mess. And and the reason yeah. I want to m- make a point of this is sergeants were classed as NCOs. They weren't officers. They were senior for the the, the non commissions, but they were not officers. And there's a very very big 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 difference in it. Um, yeah. and that, that is one of my bugbears when I read people talking about Binbrook and they say they've investigated the officer's mess no you haven't, you've investigated the sergeant's mess it doesn't mean it's any less valid or any less important but it's it's quite a it's, it's, it's a bit like saying that you've, you've, you've gone to, I don't know um, Tesco's when in actual fact you actually went to Sainsbury's it's it's kind of important in in the bigger scheme of it's, it's, there's it's important it is important in the bigger scheme of things in my view but what's quite nice about it's now is it brook and b community center it's actually yeah yeah Yeah. Yeah. what i really liked about it when we went in there is it it's not um it's not mocked up to look old it's it's actually a community center that is actually used for various various things it's not kind of it, it you know sometimes when you go into a building and it's it's still it's old and it's a bit decrepit and it gives you that kind of spooky sense the minute yeah. the minute you walk in it and mm-hmm. i think that can sometimes play with your imagination uh, when things start happening bimbrook it could just be a normal village hall yeah that's correct it's modernized and everything isn't it mm. so when was the first time you went there um, and you, you, you mentioned that a caretaker asked you to come in because there was some paranormal stuff going on what was going on? Yeah, uh, they'd reported they were, they'd just got their hands on turning it into the community centre or redecorating it and the it was a dad and daughter were doing the decorating and she'd put her keys down in one room went to get the keys for the car to go Mm-hmm. No sign of them. She'd left them on near a, a paint pot, apparently. And the dad had to go drive back to her house to pick up a spare set. And then they went home, came back the following day, and the keys were where she'd originally left them. So the keys had deported somewhere and come back. Mm-hmm. Uh, they kept getting footsteps. Other things were moving as well, weren't they? Yeah, they would go home on a night. And when they'd come back the next day, all the windows would be open on the top floor. Mm-hmm. things like that mm-hmm. and you know they, they said that there was only them had keys to the building and if it was someone even tomfoolery they'd do more than just go in and open the window well, they, they were just the two key holders weren't they yeah uh, lights been with the turn over lights off when they came back after they come back a couple of lights were left on all kinds of little stuff like that going off and we went and thought yeah it'd be a good one to do wouldn't it mm-hmm. so what were some of your early experiences some of the early ones, my gosh, from I would say our first two investigations were like amazing electric. Honestly, we had um, just to name a few. Um, we had a swing. There was a swing bin in the theatre, mm-hmm. and we were calling out, "Do something, please!" You know, anything at all, just to give us a sign of your presence. And we all witnessed as if somebody had just punched the top of the swing bin. The 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 lid just started swinging manically mm-hmm. um, that was one thing apparitions weren't there yeah um, two people as well as a group two of our team all saw an apparition of what looked like a soldier mm-hmm. stood near a window um, there was also when we were doing well, when, a, you, when you say soldier you meant someone from RAF sorry yeah an yeah. RAF I, I, I'm not up on my yes. um, military person <laughs> yeah. military person yeah a military yes. person a man in uniform <laughs> and um, another one we were all stood in a circle calling out and someone just happened to say look up and one of the lights was swinging 
And these lights, you can't you can't reach them, no matter mm. how hard you try. They are mm. way up high. And that's a single uh, floor as well, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, so. yeah. Another time we've had what sounds like banging on the roof, but in actual fact, it was a single floor building, mm-hmm. and it was um, it's a special ceiling as well because it was bomb proofed. So it, they said it would be about three meters thick. Mm-hmm. So they couldn't understand why we were hearing banging from above, as well as uh, table and glass. And I remember there's been some really good spirit box communication as well and the uh, couple of expletives have come out as well which are on our YouTube channel mm-hmm. and this was all in the early days even, even now Penny. yeah even now I mean we've only returned back probably this year and part last year but it's still getting the phenomenal account, phenomenal amount of um, paranormal activity mm. we do in the theatre we get a lot of people reporting feeling as though they've been touched being mm. grabbed um, I've actually witnessed grown men jump off that stage from, you know, a, I would say a three foot height. They literally just run and jump off the stage. Yeah. Screaming because they felt like something's grabbed them. Yeah. There's well, a couple of, rooms, couple of rooms upstairs. People don't like to go in and they'll go in. You put them on a loan vigil or two or three will go in together, you know, guests and say, oh, we felt like we were touched there or we think sort of breathing on us. And uh, it's, it's quite an interesting place. Well, let's 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 sort of break down the rooms or the areas that we we sort of go in. I mean, one mm-hmm. of the areas that I was lucky enough to you you let me go in when I was there was kind of the basement cellar. Yeah, bit. yeah, that's that's the escape room, that isn't it? It is, yeah. Bomb. Yeah, and and because I had quite decent boots on, I did walk down that strange oh, tunnel yeah. that that, that yeah. lead actually leads out to like you say an escape escape hatch that yeah, when fine. I went then outside to see where it would come out it comes out sort of in the middle of the grass out out the front of the mess mm. now I know that you know that area is quite small it's quite tight you can't fit that many people in it and and I know that you you, you kindly let Wayne and I because you trusted me you let me and Wayne go down there on our own to do a few vigils now even even he sort of said that he felt that he was being watched in the tunnel mm. and 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 you could kind of see almost like shadows i can't say shadows moving that's not the right way of putting it but you, you could kind of almost see the darkness moving um but it it, it just had it, it felt very sort of like just being observed nobody said anything there was nothing because i had a digital running the whole time and I yeah. got a K2 and I did tr- I did power the spirit box up to see if anything would come through on that and it didn't but it, it, it did feel a bit strange and it felt like I was being just watched that, that's the only way I could describe it just being watched now have you guys experienced stuff down there and in that tunnel before? Yeah I've had some good vigils down there with a the table tapping and I remember a couple of instances you know there's the metal supports for the uh, floor you know the mm. big metal poles Mm. We've tapped on them. I tapped on one near us, and then the one you know, the other side of the room, we've had tapping come back on that with nobody near it. And um, and I, I remember, rightly, I think it, about three, four years ago, was you know, you call it out, show yourself as a light. You know how dark it is there, Penny, with that mm. sort of daughter and the stairs. Mm. The room they took I only briefly for like you know a second or so, just lit up. Nobody put a touch torch on so you can see it's come out of someone's hand or pocket but no torch on it just lit up in the far corner I think about mm. six of us saw it out at group mm. so we've had some really good times there to be honest okay well I don't think it was actually it, the, the escape hatch part never had to be used um, looking no, at the, the, the history so. of Binbrook but Binbrook was attacked uh, in the early days actually I think it was in, um, when it was first opened as a bomber base in 1940 um, fortunately there wasn't many aircraft actually there because um they didn't they decided not to put a decent runway in and um they were trying to fly fairy battles from there which are a lightweight mono-engined um they only have like three personnel on single bombers single-use bombers but they were also flying the bigger wellingtons from there and the wellingtons as soon as the ground got soggy was basically sinking into the ground they couldn't function so they had actually pulled most personnel away from there while they were sorting the runways out and that's when the Luftwaffe strafed it um so it, it was actually attacked when there was hardly anything there so I don't think those tunnels were I mean I'm sure they ran drills and all that kind of thing to do w- w- what if if we do need to evacuate yeah. at speed or or literally just use it as an air raid 
shelter if you're in in the mess hall but it it didn't doesn't feel well the main part of that cellar didn't feel intimidating to me but as I walked along that tunnel bit it started to feel a bit more threatening it's the yes. only way I can describe it I I I, I kind of it's my protected as well because it's one way in and one way out possibly possibly but I felt fine that it, that it was I felt fine once I got to the very end of it where the ladder is yeah um but along the tunnel and I could see Wayne at the other end because he had the torch he was sort of holding the torch to the ground so that you know so he wasn't illuminating it but I could see him and and I could see the the hatch at the other end as well but it almost felt as I sort of was about two-thirds of the way down that tunnel that there, there were, there, something was there that didn't want me there that's the only way I can explain it and obviously yeah. the tunnel gets underwater quite easily doesn't it because it was quite yeah. and I know that I was walking through water um, but there, there, there's something sort of about two thirds of the way down it it felt quite um, angry um, I don't know I didn't sort of pick up anything else but it, it was, but the rest of the place, the cellar itself, doesn't. Most, you know, people always go into cellars and think they're really scary and nasty. And I didn't, don't feel that in that one. I don't feel. Yeah. It, it, don't, don't, f- it didn't feel I intimidating. Anything, I don't think there's anything malicious in the building at all. To be honest, it's. No. Um, I find, you find with servicemen and people who've been armed forces, to be quite. Um, amusing and funny, you know, they want to make you laugh, you know, they want to entertain you. Yeah, dark you know, sense of humour. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that uh, gallows humour, isn't it, yeah. almost? Yeah, definitely. definitely. I always imagine them as like men, and there's lots of women there, obviously, on our events, and I think we just enjoy making them jump and things like that, yeah. but all in a fun way rather than malicious. Well, I'll talk about the flirting from summer something there with uh, myself and one of the other the woman who was in my group whose name I'm, I really genuinely can't remember but that that was yeah that's my experience normally in military bases they're very flirtatious you get yeah. the odd one that is annoyed that a woman is there and they shouldn't be there and they're acting far to um um without decorum but I I normally find that especially the younger blokes are flirts they they want to flirt they want to sort of it's a woman therefore I must flirt sort of thing yeah so that's the cellar area the next area I want to go to is the area that you used as the um if you like the rec room the meeting place which I believe is used as a play school or nursery now during the day isn't it yeah the school yeah yeah they're like a mums and toddlers yeah now that one I think was the original mess hall wasn't it the original dining hall and 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 when my husband and I were sort of looking around it when the lights were on, you could see where certain things would have been. Like so, you can see where because I found an old photo of it, and you could see where the old fireplace would have been. You could see where there would have That's been that, yeah. um, divisions, pillars, and all that kind of thing, which was quite interesting. Now, weirdly enough, that room I found quite active. Mm-hmm. It is. It's one of my favourites. That one, Penny. I used, used to have a good night in there oh go on then you tell me some of the things that have happened to you in there Stu well I've seen tables move only only you know two or three inches with no one touching them everyone sat back away from the table their hands two or three inch above the table and the table just moved a couple of inches uh, mm-hmm. we, again with no one touching no one's feet near it no tomfoolery um, we've had some fantastic tapping on there uh, again REM pods going off and mel meters. I usually experience a lot of children in that area. But I don't know how much of your history you've done, Penny, but I was told by somebody who, who lives local that that building was built on a plague pit at one time. No, oh, I didn't go that well, far back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I was told that, that it was built on an original plague pit. Right, I don't know. I mean, it's possible. It's very possible. I didn't see that in any of the sort of stuff I was I was looking up, but it's it's possible. I mean, there's there's plague pits everywhere that we still mm. we, we still could, don't we could know make about. That your, we could make that your homework for the week. <laughs> Do you want to babysit the kids then while I'm looking it up for yes, you? <laughs> <laughs> 
Yes, I'll bring them up. I'll, I'll pop it. I'll pop them up. I'm on the A1 in a minute. Don't worry. Post, post them up. I know what you're like, Penny. You're like a dog with a bone. I bet you any money within a week you're going to get back to me and say it is or it isn't. Oh, you know me too well. You know yeah. me too well. Yes, I, I can't. Yeah, I am one of those. I can't sleep until I've double checked things. I may not do it tonight, I must admit, but it will be like next yeah. time I'm online and I've got, you know, half an hour to sort of concentrate. I might have to have a look at that. But, um, well, it was interesting because that room, um, we had some quite interesting experience with the boo bear in that room. And, and I felt childish, sort of childlike. I mean, I yeah, know Zach Bagans yeah. would say they were demons, but I felt childlike spirits. Yeah. And, and and the boo bear, um, I mean, I, I will openly admit, not a lot scares me. I blooming hate boo bears. I hate the fact they start talking to you. And <laughs> it, it's, 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 it's actually, to me, that's worse than those dolls that you lot all have that have the eyes light up in the pitch black. They like the K2 meter dolls. Um, <laughs> yeah, the boo bear when it talks. And I think Wayne had never seen one. And it started talking. He went, why is it talking? I said, because something is talk, touching it or talking to it. And he's like, OK. Um, and, and we were getting a lot of all oh, that tickles and it's cold in here. And um, when it was responds to when someone said something to it that we can't hear. And and it, there was there was definitely a young child playing with us. Yeah. I think Hannah, it was Hannah was in there, was looking after us I think if I remember rightly and and she sort of saw it going off but the thing that was that, that was most in, and I say I picked up on a child but what we also you know where the kitchen little kitchen area is at the far corner mm-hmm. that door was rattling we right. heard it and Wayne had your uh, super ears yeah. thing on and he said he thought he could hear a mouse like something scratching behind the door um and I think when we sort of looked, it was like we couldn't find any trace of a mouse, but he swore it sounded like a mouse, but we heard the door rattling. So we went to the other side to see if it, there was, it was, and it's, it's, um, it's a was fake this wall. The door into the toilet corridor? No, it's the, no, it's the one right behind the sink. Oh, well, right. It's literally a storeroom. Yeah, because we yeah. went to Hannah and I decided to go on a little sort of wander, and we went round, you know, so we through the toilet one and up the corridor that would be behind, and yeah. there's a fake, there's a fake stud, there's a stud wall, right. so somebody has created a storage area there. Yeah, but that would have been a corridor in its yeah. day, but something was rattling that door. And I sort of leant against it, and it was the same noise if someone leant against it. But when we heard the rattle, nobody was there. We actually stood there and watched it happen, uh, and did the whole jumping up and down on the floor to see if that made it move. You know, all the stuff you do to try and work out. There's no air. That there's no sort of. That's what, another reason I went to the other side. See if there was a draft. No draft, and it, it looked like it was just full of spare chairs and things like that. But it was padlocked. Um very interesting but it was a definitely a stud wall on the other side that doesn't didn't looks like it was put okay. in as part of the the modernization and to um, be fair it'd have to be a really big mouse to rattle the door wouldn't it yeah yeah i mean i heard what wayne said I, he put the ears on me so i could, and i could hear the scratching but i sort of said to him this is you know they gave kids here they'd be very cautious mm. of vermin and yeah, all that kind of thing. I mean, it might it might have been a mouse, but like you say, it would have had to have been a very big one to um, rattle that door. But we definitely more we a few of us heard it rattle so much so that we went round the other side to see if we could discover what was on the other side. And it was a stud wall, like a, a, a like I say, like a, a storage area that had been created. Yeah. Um, it was a it was a bit a bit odd. <laughs> I'm pleased that happened. I'm pleased you had a little experience in there. Well, you know me. I, I, I tend to have experiences in most places, but I did everything I could to try and disprove what it could have been. Um, yeah. but it was definitely... There, there was it, I, Where that corridor would have led originally, if there'd been a door at the end of it that led out somewhere, I don't know. Um, but that was, that, was, that was different. That was a... You know, and it happened more than once. And... Yeah. Um, I think it was the chap, and I don't know what his name was, the one who was there with his partner, 
who was getting picked on a bit on the spirit board, he heard it the first time because he came over to me and said, that door keeps rattling. And so I walked over there and I heard it as well. And there was, there's no way there could have been... There was no one there touching it on our side and there's no way there could have been anyone touching it on the other yeah. side. And there's no windows, there's no... Nothing that could have caused a draft or... And if something had fallen against it, it would have just rattled once mm. and there would have been a bang or something, but there was nothing like that. It was... I don't know. Yeah. I shall be looking for that next time I go. <laughs> um, so from 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 there, we, we shall move on upstairs and, and what's now the Taekwondo gym. Uh-huh. Yeah. That, that and he's... Is one of the most active rooms there. My theory is, because it's used the Taekwondo, Taekwondo room and karate, I think the energy is at the, the um, fighters disperse in the room and obviously the energy stays mm-hmm. in the room. I think the spirits use that energy just like an EMF pump, basically. Mm. And that is actually the room originally when we got called in where yeah. all the windows were getting opened on a night. Ah. Now those are the original windows I think as well yeah, from yeah, the MOD yeah, building yeah. aren't they in there if I yeah, remember rightly when I was looking at them and, and Wayne was giving me his builder's assessment of them and he said he think he, they looked to him like original ones and you could see where the girders would have been where there would have been partition yeah. walls and all that because I think it was possibly sort of like quarters or yeah. or rest quarters or something like that yeah, for the but more seniors. Yeah but, we, but I think they said it were bedrooms so we were, so mm. we were old from the locals but um, whether that's true, I don't know. But I it, imagined them being like, you know, like a hospital ward with loads of beds down. That's what I that's imagine. How we it. Yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah I think when when Wayne looked at it, he said the girders and the way that they were done, it looked almost like they had been separating walls. So yeah. um, it may not have been like one long dormitory. It would have been sort of three yeah. or four, three or four rooms, which which would make more sense. But so so, what sort of activity have you picked up in there? Had, you know, the old style cat balls you know with a bell mm-hmm. I've had them in that room and I distinctly remember them moving once and you know it's a flat it's a flat floor it's, mm. there's no there's no camber or anywhere like that and I remember them going and we've had who <laughs> wants a better word twinkling, twinkling fairy lights as well have been seen yeah um, um, the people who called us in told us that a little boy's often seen in the window in that area Looking out, isn't he? Yeah, 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 looking out. Okay. Okay. And, and it's very strange considering what the building is. And not again, it's... necessarily. Not necessarily well, because I actually found an. I was looking in some old newspaper reports, and there was an awful lot of adverts for um, uh, shared accommodation for married couples who were yeah. going to be based at RAF Binbrook because. They would have been married quarters, uh, and which is now the village of Brookenby. A that lot of those old houses were the MOD married quarters. But they did encourage um, men to bring, and it was predominantly men, I'm not being sexist here, it was predominantly men, um, mm-hmm. to bring their wives and children to live near them. So that, that you know, even, uh, question the logic of that, but th- that that was encouraged. So there's no nothing to say it wasn't one of the sergeant's kids. Yeah, yeah. The, houses, the houses are identical to most RAF bases yes. from the time, don't the sixties yeah. and seventies? Yeah, and earlier. Um, yeah, so it, it, it could have been it was one of the flight crew's kids mm. who was looking out the window waiting for dad to come home. Yeah, that is. Um, it's 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 plausible. I didn't I didn't find anything of any children you know being killed um no. in the area yeah. but it could just be it's a, it's like a um a residual thing of the the kid was looking through those windows waiting to see his dad's aeroplane come home um yeah. probably from the earlier part because from um 1943 which i believe it was the summer of 1943 if i check my notes yeah may 1943 um one of the hardest working bomber squadrons of the whole Second World War ended up moving to Binbrook. Um, the 460 squadron, which was made up predominantly of um, well Australian and New Zealand mm. crews. Now, 
I say they're the hardest working squadron. Um, some of the statistics about them, which I was looking up today, and this, this is quite mind blowing. They dropped in a, near just under twenty nine thousand tons of bombs as a squadron. They flew six thousand two hundred sixty four sorties. They um, they accomplished thirty thousand five hundred twenty six flying hours. Com- um, Combative, combative flying hours, not just flying in general, but actually in combat. Um, and they lost something in the region of 181 aircraft, um, wow. with a total fatalities of 1,018, and of that, over 50% were Australian fatalities. They apparently were the, the 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 squadron that dropped the most bombs in the whole of World War Two, and they moved to Bimbrook from um, an airbase, not a million miles away, it was in East East Yorkshire, Brayton, RAF Brayton. They moved to Bimbrook in the May of 1943 with their Lancasters. So it probably would have been the son of someone before that, because I don't think many of the Australians actually brought mm. their wives what, and kids over with them. What theatre what theater were, were they dropping the bombs then? Where about... <laughs> Um, a lot from from the battles I was looking at there was a lot in Denmark um, right, Holland yeah. that sort of area um, so Europe the European the, the European yeah. but there, there there was a story of one of the bombers um, I found I, th- I think it was 460 he, they went down in a marsh in Denmark um, yeah. and all bar one of them now there would have been eight crew on a lank and all bar one of them is still in the aeroplane in the marsh and yeah. all, all that's pointing up is part of its tail fin. There's actually a memorial there. They have a memorial <laughs> to them. Um, and yeah, all bar one of the crew is still in the aircraft in the marsh because they just couldn't pull the plane up. Um, stories like that are quite sort of um, sobering. Yeah. But yeah, so the 460. But there, there were squadrons there before. The 12th and the 142nd were there before, and they were flying things like Wellingtons. Um, and it's funny you said fairy lights, because one of the aircraft that was flown from there was a fairy battle. Right. Yeah. Um, and they would have suffered losses as well. But it, it, I think it was more when the 460 was there that there, there was the the bigger, the bigger mm. losses, if you like. Um, so that yeah, that room. I, th- I like I like your your thinking about the um, the martial arts being sort of like an energy pump. Yeah, like a little, little EMF pump going off mm. there. I think to be honest with you. Hmm, that's an interesting one. That's an interesting one. I must admit that was a room that if I'd been able to stay over, I would have wanted to sleep in that room. Yeah. On that floor. Part of the fact it's yeah. a cushioned floor, <laughs> sprung floor. Um, yeah. And it's got the mats there as well. Yeah, it's I'm not stupid. Um, <laughs> but those windows, they were intriguing me. And the partitions were intriguing me. I found those quite... Um, there was something about them. Something about them. Um, the other area that you, you go into is the theatre. What is now? Yeah, the now, now the theatre. Well, yeah. Do you know what it was in its day? <laughs> We were told it was the mess room, you know, for the uh, I mean the the meals in there. Yeah. Right. Okay. Originally. Yeah. yeah. That's what the, that's what we told us when the uh, when we first went through there. Okay. Um, it was quite quiet when I was in there with you guys, if I remember rightly. I mean, we had a spirit board going that was quite sort of bouncing around all over the place. But in general, um, I know we put Wayne up on the stage on his own to try and. <laughs> frighten him it didn't work I'm afraid, I'm afraid. we've got to try harder um, but it, the room itself was quite quite apart from I could swore I could see someone standing by the racks of clothes but I don't know whether that was just my eyes mm. playing tricks on me because it was quite late at night yeah. what sort of things are, are there any sort of names that have come through when you've been in there on a frequent basis or experiences that more and more people have reported having in that part in our earlier days, when we used to go in the early days, um, we used to regularly get three soldiers whenever we went. If we got the group to go, the whole group to sit on the stage, um, we always used to encounter the same three spirits of three men in uniform, I'll say. Mm-hmm. Um, one called Freddie, one called Edward, and I can't remember what the third one were called. 
but they used to come through every time we went and they were the ones that caused so much havoc used to um, it was almost like they played people off against each other one by one you'd get people oh my god I've just felt this and then the next one oh my god I've just felt that and then the next one and it would continue like that until almost everyone in the group had had an experience do you mm-hmm. know what I mean and that was almost every time we went and then the last few times we've been it's almost as if they've just disappeared then three I don't know if they're on holiday <laughs> yeah. you have to remember how many, how, many, how many people have worked and lived there over the years as yeah. well so it's a, a real mm. cacophony different spirits but uh, as for names I, I mean like Rosa I remember the Freddy now she mentioned it we've had some really good table work in there and lights as well mm-hmm. uh, temperature drops even though it's not been cold in there when in the summer uh, breezes as well and that's when we've got the lights as well on the stage we've got some really mm-hmm. peculiar lights and there's been apparitions seen in there as well in that room mm. But that's it's quite you know because of the fact that that area is used as a theatre now. Yeah. You do you tend to get a lot of things in theatres anyway, don't you? It seems to be theatres do tend to be quite superstitious yeah. places. So it'd be interesting to know if the activity is because of it's now a theatre, yeah. or if it is from its days yeah. as an RAF base. Um, theatres is the same principle. What we upstairs with the uh, Taekwondo. Mm. It's the, the energy in the room, you know, from where they're doing the, their acting mm. or the singing and anything like that, the dancing. That, the energy's there. Mm. Again, just acting like a little EMF pump, really. Mm. And spirits use. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, what you, you were saying about the three guys who would cause havoc. Again, yeah. knowing flight crew, the history of flight crews and what they're like, that doesn't surprise me either because those crews, when you, when you look at the... Um, and, and this isn't sort of necessarily relating just to Bimbrook, it's bomber crews in general. They were very, very close knit because they, they you know, that bomber crews lost in general, bomber command in World War Two lost over 50% of its men. Um, yeah. You know, if Lancaster went down, that's eight men gone. And so the, as crews, they were very, very tightly knit. They were a team. They they were very superstitious as well, a lot of them. They didn't like it if they a crew member had to be changed, especially at the last minute. Um, they were very superstitious about who they would fly with. A lot of them, for example, didn't like a novice rear gunner coming in because a novice rear gunner wouldn't necessarily have the right reactions to someone who's more experienced and knew what they were looking for. So... It doesn't surprise me if there's three lads messing yeah. around because of the fact that they would have been so closely knit yeah. in in life. Um, they've they've, cre- they've still got that team thing, especially not necessarily the pilot or the engineer. I'm talking about like the gunners and uh, the the bombardier as well to an extent. Um, it, it would be and now you've mentioned those names. There are t- and I haven't written them down, but I know when I was doing my research, there's two quite famous bombers that went from there with the 460 and I'm going to see if any of their names were crew crew, because that would be quite interesting Um, uh, but they they would have been incredibly close and they they would have been an almost sort of I don't almost like that spooky twin like thing the way they could communicate with each other without speaking because I guess the the, you know you've got like a a 7-8 hour flight on a Lancaster to get over to wherever you're bombing um, and and then you've got to drop your bombs and try and fly th- fly through flak and beat the the Messerschmitts that are coming after you and then get back safely. That's a lot of adrenaline and a lot of sort of bonding that has yeah. to go on because, you know, you've got each other's lives in your hands, I suppose. Yeah. So it wouldn't surprise me they, they're being buggers together. <laughs> yeah, I agree. You could tell... You know, they were coming through together as mates together, causing yeah. the same havoc together. Um, it was almost like they were proud, you know, and, and not frightened to admit it. Yeah, we're here. We're the ones doing it. Mm. Yeah. I mean, one of my favourite facts, and I'm just throwing this out there about Bimbrook, is it was actually one of the places that Memphis Bell was filmed. It's, yeah, that's right. right, yeah. And I think that's one of my favourite facts about the place. I know quite a few a few little airfields in the UK were used for the filming of Memphis Bell, but it, the fact that Bimbrook was one of the main the main the main ones. But I want to actually uh, talk about one of the things I've read 
in a lot of people's reports about Binbrook and I'd appreciate you to sort of let me know your thoughts on this there, there, there does always seem to be a, almost like Chinese whispers when it comes to if you like resident hauntings and, and ones that people talk about having seen time and time again and there is one at Binbrook and that's supposedly a, a, a sergeant who's nicknamed who's known as Clubfoot who's seen an Australian apparently who's seen walking around the Perry track sort of trying to flag down cars and and all of that and the story that goes along with him is that he was his name was Sergeant Sinclair he was Australian member of the 460th and he uh, apparently he was he was injured because of a pilot or something's ineptitude that caused him to be injured hence he was nicknamed Clubfoot and he became ground crew and he was so annoyed at the fact that this person's ineptitude had caused him to be injured that he decided to sabotage some of the planes, some of the aircraft, some of the lanks. Um, why he still haunts the place, I don't know, because there's no follow-up to what happened to him and, and why he would still he would still be there. Um, but it's it's one of those that I thought, well, I'll have a look. I'll have a look to see if I can find a Sergeant Sinclair attached to the 460. Yeah. Mm. Have you guys ever come across this clubfoot? Have you heard of him? Has anyone ever mentioned seeing him? We've never had a Sergeant Sinclair come no. through. Never. Mm. I've, ne- I've never even had a man with a limp come through, to be honest with you. Okay. Uh, but isn't he reported more on the outside of, you know... Yeah, the lanes yeah he, he's, he's more like an that. outside apparition apparently I think, I think locals have been seeing him for the last with no 30 40 years I think more than yeah. anything but it yeah. does baffle me how you know somebody's seen this apparition where did they get the name from who came up with the name well I exactly exactly I mean there's an awful lot of sort of like oh well somebody who was based there said his nickname was Clubfoot but there's an awful but there's no sort of names of people who said that's who it was it's all like well my next door neighbour's friend told yeah yeah so and so down the pub told me so I thought it's going to pull up at the road and say you know my name's Sergeant Sinclair exactly (laughs) exactly so me being me I spent about three hours today looking at RAF Royal Australian Air Force and even WAF records to see if I could find a Sergeant Sinclair who was attached to the 460 who was ground crew Mm mhm three hours roughly three hours I went everywhere I went every single thing I could think of to find one not a sausage not a sausage like I say I looked at RAF I looked at Royal Australian Air Force I looked at uh, even WAF because I thought maybe it was a female Sergeant Sinclair nothing the only thing I found I did find a Sergeant Sinclair who was attached to the 460 Now, this is um, Sergeant Clarence Frederick Sinclair, who was from Wilberforce in New South Wales, and he was a navigator come observer uh, with the 460. Um, But he flew on Wellingtons, not Lancasters. He also flew from RAF Brayton, which is where the 460 was before it moved in the May of 1943 to um, Bimbrook. Now, it couldn't have been him because he was um, shot down in on the 25th of and 26th of July, 1942. It was my birthday. Quite weird, isn't it? These, how these things happen. This date pops up and it was actually last week and it was my birthday. Um, he was shot down and he was taken... Uh, he was a prisoner of war. Uh, Stalak 344. Now, he was released in the end of October 1945 and from what I can trace he ended up back in Australia and married a Bessie Main in I couldn't find the date but he married her uh, it would have been between 1945 and 1955 um, in Sydney now it can't have been him because he would never have been at Binbrook he would have his his squadron didn't move to Binbrook until what 10 months after he was actually taken he was a prisoner of war at Stalak 344 so it couldn't have been him but he's the only Sergeant Sinclair I could find associated with the 460 so I thought well let's have a look and see if there's been any incidents with aircraft and there was 
on the 3rd of July 1943, so only a few months after uh, the Australian Air Force, if you like, want of a better term, landed at Binbrook, um, they were loading incendiary bombs onto the Lancasters, and incendiary bombs were notoriously volatile. And for some reason, one of the the crew accidentally, or so the report says, accidentally armed one, and it went off, and it destroyed two Lancasters and damaged seven others. And again, that's that's one that some reports say it was the Lancasters with the 12th that were destroyed. Well, the 12th actually moved in September of 1942, and this took place in July of 1943, so it's going to be the 460, not the 12th, but that's just me being a nerd and pointing things like that out um, I just wonder if people you couldn't believe that that was just an accident and I've started to come up with a name that they can attribute I, because there was definitely aircraft were destroyed on the ground which is what this Sergeant Sinclair's clubfoot is meant to have done but I cannot find a ground crew member called Sergeant Sinclair who was at Binbrook mm. Well, I think it's probably, like you said, somebody somewhere way down the line, yeah, has come up with a name for him and just continued on throughout the years. Mm. Yeah, That's and it. sort of Chinese whispers as yeah. nobody I mean, ever bothered to dig into it. You're driving down a lane and you see an apparition, which very rarely happens, but, you know, there's no way you're going to know that person's name. Mm. No. No, unless somebody says, oh, I remember there was a Sergeant Sinclair or Sergeant this. and But there was nothing like Sinclair was ground crew. I, I the, say the only Sinclair I could find attached to the 460 was this Sergeant Clarence, who I am not in any way insinuating it was him because he was a prisoner of war. He couldn't have done it. Um, and he was never at Binbrook, so it can't have been him. But he is the only Sinclair I can find attached to the 460. So... <sighs> It could be anybody who they've seen. Anybody. Mm. Anybody with the limp. Mm. But what's the chance of getting onto some of the other parts of the airfield? There's actually quite a good chance of, um, you know, the, they're all... When we come out after our events, there's actually a lot of ghost hunters around mm-hmm. doing their own investigations of the grounds themselves. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's really funny because I, I'm on on the Brook and Bee page on my Facebook and some people had put on you know, something was very strange last night, there was a lot of men around the community centre in black all standing around <laughs> and <laughs> just funnily enough we come out of our event at 2 o'clock in the morning and there was half a dozen men just stood there in black and I think, I think there was one woman as well yeah, and yeah. a woman and um, we were just laughing we're like the ghost hunters they're obviously doing their own little investigation of the ground they look like like little ninjas and they thought (laughs) took car and they said they thought we owned the building asked us if we could like let them have a recce round they said we were up yesterday walking around the grounds and then that's when we put two and two together and people were saying watch out for the people somebody's been walking around you know just in almost like combat gear as well yeah you can go up there and walk around the grounds and do your own little investigation to be honest with you because it's i think it's what intrigues me is the fact those hangars are original and, yeah and i think they use a lot of the hangars for industrial they do. work yeah. Yeah. yeah but there's also in one of them i believe they um they've got a restored because because after world war Two, the, the base didn't shut and it actually became home to various other aircraft and one of them was the um um, English Electric Lightning and I'm pretty sure one of the hangars it's where they've got a restored lightning that they power up every so often oh. to keep it flying oh. um, and that would be an interesting one to, I probably couldn't because it's probably full of equipment and you know, safety and all that kind of thing but um, I do know that that's one of the hangars they, 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 I can't remember what the group's called but they're uh, you know to preserve the lightning the, the aircraft yeah. the lightning yeah. Um that's one of theirs but it, it's it's um yeah getting into one of those hangars would be interesting that would be very interesting cuz so we had a look around one didn't we about 7 8 years it was just full of all plastics and mm. was one big It room. was a big recycling center. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. 
But one of the interesting things I've had happen at ha- old hangars before is I've set a digital recorder down by the doors, like the main, not the the little entrance door, but the main hangar, you know, the pull doors, I suppose you could call them, and um, got the noise of the doors being opened on the digital, but there was nobody mm. opening the doors. That's interesting. Mm. So it's they're they're kind of I would have said it was obviously residual from yeah. from whenever it was in use, but it's it's definitely interesting. And I mean, when you when you look at an RAF base like that, it's, they're so huge. You know, when you actually look at the maps of them, which you know, I'm I say I'm a nerd. I admit it. I look at things like that. Um, you don't realise quite how big an area these RAF bases and US Air Force bases as as they were during World War Two, they covered. They were huge. Yeah. Huge. Yeah, I mean the mini little airports, aren't they? Really, villages, little mini towns, aren't they? Yeah. They are. The they're, they're, they're mini villages, a bit like they almost like the cotton mill villages were, sort of hundred years previously. Yeah. They, they are their own little sort of industry. Um, but when you see all the sort of the, the the dispersal sites and all those kind of things on them, it's it's mm. quite quite fascinating. Um, but it's. Um, yeah, uh, say the it was a very heroic squadron that were based there towards the end of the war, and um, there is actually a plaque to, uh, dedicated towards them in the village church. If anyone ever mm. goes there and wants to go and have a look at it, um, the village of Brookenby or Brimbrook, whatever you want to call it, does actually they do remember their heroes even though they weren't British, which I think is good. I think yeah. it's very good. Well, at an hour, guys. Really? Is it that? It's flown by. Wow. Time flies when you're having fun. It does. It always is when we're with you. Oh, bless you. Bless you, Cottons. Well, I've got to go up and look about plague pits now. So, um... (laughs) (laughs) I want you home at my table by by lunch tomorrow. (laughs) Oh, give me a break. (laughs) I've got to try. I'm working and looking after the kids at the same time. You know, things aren't getting turned around as fast as they would. That excuse is as bad as the dogs chewed me own work. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, she has done that before. Um, <laughs> she did chew up a report that I'd written. I wrote it, printed it out, and came back half an hour later, and she chewed the thing up. Fortunately, it was on my computer, oh, and I no. printed another one off, but it has actually happened. So, if anyone wants to book for your uh, trip to the old manor house in Ferry Hill, are there still tickets available? There are still tickets yeah. available, yes, on SGN Events. So all they have to do That's is go over there. Simply go snights.co.uk. And we also return to RAF Binbrook in September as well. Ooh. I did like that place. I did find it interesting. I was very impressed with my husband driving us home at three o'clock in the morning, but I was forced feeding him Haribo and Coke and everything to keep him awake. Coke. Um, Diet Coke. The drink. Oh, Not the oh, stuff sorry. you snort up your nose. No. <laughs> 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 he's not listening he's actually sitting on the sofa looking at his phone I, I, I'm surprised he didn't actually cotton on to that one no no, the, the brown stuff that you drink energy because he'd, he'd gone, we'd gone through all the Red Bulls so we had to go on to the slightly lesser caffeinated stuff But when, you, when you've had a really good night the adrenaline kicks in doesn't it for two, yeah. two or so hours yeah it's brilliant yeah I was more concerned about keeping him awake though for the drive home that yeah um, because you, your eyes do tend to go a bit, but he's quite he's quite good at driving on hardly any sleep. So it was easier for me to be the one talking at him to keep him awake, and he did the driving bit. Yeah. But um, it was definitely an experience, and definitely one that I'd recommend to people to do. Um, it's and I, I say, as I said at the beginning, I like it because it's not dressed up to look like what it was. Mm. Um, so you and unless you've done the research beforehand, you wouldn't know. Um, it just looks like it just looks like a sort of well nineteen forties esque building. Yeah, yeah, and that you know there are a lo- the lovely people up there as well. Mm. You know they they really looked after us. There was one one time we did an event there last year, and it it snowed quite bad while we were there. Mm. We actually got snowed in, and the mm. villagers looked after us we, really well. We uh, took account of the BBC weather app, which said there were going to be no snow. And we all set off in earnest, and we all got really excited. And then it's got its own little microclimate. And mm. in about two hours of being there, there was a, about four, five, six inches of snow. We, we couldn't leave the uh, 
the area so they let us sleep in the in the building itself I mean our bike we didn't have any we weren't prepared for it we were good because at them. to get into Binbrook no matter which way you go you've got to go down a hill or up yeah. a hill yeah, so the cars yeah. were struggling to get yeah. up the hill or down the hill mm. in the morning went, in the morning went to the shops uh, to get some power seats most for Rosie and uh, so I went to the shop assistant and she says oh you were the ones who were trapped last night and I went yeah unfortunately she went well yeah, did you not see see the weather forecast? I went, well, I went to my BBC weather app and there were no snow predicted at all. And she went, oh, no, you need to go on the um, meteorological sites. Don't bother with BBC. Yeah. She says, you need the actual meteorological sites to have a look on. And then when we looked on that, it was total different weather, weren't it, altogether? Mm-hmm. But we got, we got home eventually. As, as, yeah, we always do, don't we? We always, we always get yeah. home eventually, even if we've had a... A, a few unforeseen things thrown at us. Well, well, I'm I'm going to have to say goodbye to you guys now because as much as I enjoy chatting to you, I've got to got to close this show out. But that has been the lovely Rosie and Stuart Dawson from Simply Ghost Nights. I say they have loads of events on. They are such hardworking guys, and their team are cracking as well. Got a shout out to their team; who are brilliant. And they go to some fascinating places. And say one of the places that I am so looking forward to investigating with them Ripon Workhouse which hopefully going to be next year now but um, I can't wait to do that one with them and uh, I say I'm looking forward to hearing about the old manor house at some point as well they run a tight ship well worth going along to an investigation with well on that note next week I'm going to be talking to the author Jamie Rubio from America and we're going to be talking about something called Niles Canyon and Jamie is a bit similar to me in that she likes to dispel myths and give people true historical fact as to what events are. So you're probably going to hear us agreeing with each other an awful lot. Team history, I guess you could call it. But until next week, my lovelies, until next week, have a good evening. Sleep tight and don't worry too much about things that go bump in the night. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to join us for more shows throughout the week. Find us on Facebook, Twitter and the World Wide Web to keep up to date with all the shows right here on Parasearch Radio.